And it'll be taken from Proverbs 1, 5, and 6. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Byron Zelenax, our guest speaker. It's been a couple years, I think, what, three, three-ish years, if I remember right, since we had uh, Byron here, but it's good to have you back. So uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Dave. It is certainly good to be back here today. And, yeah, it has been a while, and I was trying to do the inventory in my mind, you know, as, as we age, um, the long-term memory is sometimes better working than the short-term memory. So if you were, uh, if, if you were to ask me what I did uh, a week ago, not really sure, but it's, this has sort of crept into the long-term memory uh, because uh, it, it, it was four years ago and probably right around this time roughly and it was like the first or second week uh, that everybody was starting to come out of the COVID hibernation. And so I remember being here and there was a few here and, you know, it was still at that place where everybody's just kind of looking at everybody like, are, are you contagious? <laughs> it, was, it was just a, a really odd time. But it had, had a wonderful time here, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I, I just remember that time and it stands out. But uh, Certainly, it's, it's good to be here again, and um, my mother wanted to be here uh, on a number of occasions. She's accompanied me here. We attended here uh, years ago, and uh, certainly is good friends with Annette, and is acquainted with several of you, and she certainly extends her love, uh, wishes she could be here, but, you know, as, as she is getting older, it's... You know, it's a it's a bigger deal when when you when you're traveling. So, uh, anyways, uh, any time I have uh, the opportunity to 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 uh, give the message, uh, whether she's there or not, she'll always ask me. So, what are you preaching about? Okay, <laughs> and uh, I always have a hard time answering that because I don't I don't think topically. In other words, I, I can just give her a, sort of a, like a one-word uh, answer and say, well, it's about this. It's, it's usually sort of a line of thought, a stream of consciousness type of thing. And usually she'll ask me something like that, and I'll say, well, I'm preaching on sin and how I'm against it. And, and I just kind of leave it. <laughs> I, I just kind of leave it at that usually. But, uh, but I, I'll say this, the, uh, the message today, which in some ways corresponds well with the sub school lesson uh, in many ways, I, I, I'm not gonna, going to be focusing on parables, but, but uh, it is uh, a focus on how uh, God, uh, particularly through his word many times, dialogues with us, how he interacts with us. Um, he's a God that wants to communicate with, with us, and so... Um, it is it's sort of in, 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 that, in that train of thought that, that we're going to look at some passages in Scripture, particularly through uh, some, some uh, carefully placed questions that we find there. Uh, let me just bow, my he- uh, bow our heads for a, a couple of uh, moments while I just add another word of prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, please give me stillness of heart and mind to speak the words that you would have me to speak. Amen. So, I was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I tend to not think topically. I just, uh, uh, typically I have tons of notes in my Bible, um, and they're sort of linked to, in multi-directions, and usually I find something, and I'm like, oh, I like that. And then it points me to another verse, and then it points me to another verse, and then I end up wherever I end up. Um, and a, a few weeks ago, uh, I sort of encountered something that sort of brought it all together. Um, uh, my family and I, we were uh, with some friends for sort of an extended weekend up at a sort of a mountain retreat up in Virginia. And, you know, when you 
get like an Airbnb type situation. You go in there and they, you know, they decorate it a certain way and they have little interesting things sitting around, you know, to kind of pique your interest and all that. And on the lower shelf of, of the, uh, I guess a stand that they had uh, in, in the in the kitchen and dining room area, they had this book and it was it was sort of a thick book, and uh, and it was titled "The Book of Answers," the Book of Answers, and I'm like, oh, that sounds deep. I've never heard of the Book of Answers, and you know, <laughs> and so you know, out, out of curiosity, I cracked open this book and. Uh, you know, it, it didn't necessarily need to be that big because it's like they, they had like one sentence on each page, <laughs> you know, and it was sort of these general truisms that, um, you know, it, it, it was sort of like reading your horoscope or, or, or uh, what, back in the day they had the eight balls and all this stuff, stuff that Christians generally frown upon, you know, and, and, and the instructions, I think, for this book are you're supposed to, like, whatever question you have, you're supposed to go to this book and you're supposed to, like, pause and, like, run your hand over the, over the book and then flip it open to a certain page and it's going to give you an answer that's going to be helpful for you. Um, so... I was like, well, this is interesting. I, I didn't realize there was such a thing. And, um, you know, as, as I said, this is, this, uh, in theory, shouldn't be something that we, uh, we, we, you know, we should seek out uh, when, we, when we go to a book looking for answers um, necessarily. Um, and it's interesting over the years. I've, I, I, it brought to my memory the, the fact that I've heard a number of people say that the Bible is a book of answers. And certainly there are answers to be had in the Bible. And um, I, I, I don't want to dismiss that. Um, answers are important. We need answers. Um, and, you know, there's a number of books out there. They're, they're either like this book, uh, this book of answers, or they're sort of the counter to that. There's, a, there's another book called the Book of Questions. And it's sort of like a conversation starter if you're in a... Uh, on a long trip and you're in a car with people and you know you you know pull out one of these questions and it's sort of a conversation starter to kind of you know kind of work through the boredom and the time that you're you're driving in the car uh, found another book called the book with no answers <laughs> um, it, but, but but it's it's more along the lines of the book of questions but they called themselves uh, it, uh, it called itself the book with no answers and it talked about the importance of asking questions um, and the Bible is both. The Bible is both. There's answers, but then there's also questions. And so uh, it's through that lens that, that we're going to spend a lot of our time today. Um, oftentimes the resistance to, to kind of viewing uh, uh, Scripture in this way, some people can say, well, you know, God does not change. He is, uh, you know, he is who he is, and we just need to find the answers and find the facts and, and take it straight from there. Uh, certainly, God is is uh, he does not change in, in in terms of his essence and in terms of his character. But it's something along the lines of uh, 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 one of our uh, scholars at, at Andrews, by the name of John Peckham, uh, wrote a book recently called "God with Us," and he describes it as a qualified immutability. And it's the view that God does not change with respect to his nature and his character. But he does change in, uh, relationally in response to, to people. Does that make sense? So you have this fixed, you have, you, you have God who is, I mean, he's perfect. There's nothing you can add or subtract from him. But um, he, he in his graciousness has been willing to sort of engage with us in, in questions. And so this is why you can, you, you can uh, take passages where Moses, well, for example, when, when God uh, is talking to Moses and he, he says, well, you know, why don't I just get rid of all these Israelites and Moses, you and me, we just start something new, okay? And Moses' answer was, no, I, you know, if need be, take, take me out, blot me out. And it's not at that point that, 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 uh, that God's like, oh, well, you know, what was I thinking? You're so right. I, I just got a little carried away. He, he was bringing Moses into this conversation, and he was giving Moses a little bit of a lesson about, about his graciousness and his mercy. Um, and, and certainly there, there, there's 
other passages, certainly when Jesus walked the earth, there was lots of dialogue. There was lots of interactions. And Jesus himself asked a, a lot of questions. Um, so we're just going to focus on maybe like four questions today in Scripture. And um, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about these questions. First of all, these are questions that God is asking. Okay, Most of the questions that you find in Scripture that people are asking are usually along the lines of, why is this happening? <laughs> okay, um, Those are important questions and important, important for people to ask, but the questions that God asks, I think, are profound, even though sometimes they can be very basic. Sometimes they can be so simple that you sort of look past them. And, um, but I have, I have found uh, personally and also in, in my work that sometimes th- uh, the most basic questions can be the most profound. I've worked with, uh, in, in my counseling practice, oftentimes I've worked with somebody who's struggling through something and ask them, if you ask them the question of, what do you want? Well, that's a very basic, very basic question, right? But the thing is, is nobody, no, nobody around this person has asked them, what do you want? Okay? They're free with giving advice. They're free of just like, oh, well, you need to do this and you do that and do that. And I simply just ask, what do you want? And sometimes you can just sort of hear a sigh of, oh, well, I'm not sure. Or I, I want this. Or, or I think maybe I want this. And, and, and it, it draws, it draws the, the, the person being asked into to asking him, you know, him or herself uh, what they need to do how they need to move from here. And so we're going to, we are going to start in um, the, the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Um, and by the way, I, as, as I, I, was, I was looking at this this morning, I was like, you know, this is really the first question that God asked in Scripture, the first question I can find. Um, certainly there's questions asked before this, but they were asked by Satan. <laughs> And, and they're sort of an intentional misdirect, okay? And here God is, uh, keep in mind, this is, this is uh, chapter 3, verse 9. Adam and Eve have already eaten of the fruit. They've sinned. They've messed up. And it says, um, verse 8, The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Uh, literally, that, it, it says, in the wind of the day. So, we're not sure what it means to walk with God in, 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 in the breeze of the day. You know, was it a spiritual wind that, that was kind of walking with them and talking with them when, before they fell? I don't know. Anyways, that's, that, that, that's what it says. Um, but, but they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so the Lord called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? This is, this is the most basic question that God asked uh, those in, who he's created. Um, there's a couple of books that were written years ago. Um, one of them, a um, very good book uh, by uh, a Christian writer uh, by the name of A.W. Tozer called uh, in, in Pursuit of God. And he, he wrote another book uh, called uh, God's Pursuit of Man. And God's pursuit of man precedes man's pursuit of God. <laughs> you know, um, one of the most profound things in, in my life, as I began to walk with the Lord more, you know, I, I, I remembered that I, th- this feeling that I was kind of groping around, struggling around, looking for God, and then that profound thought that, well, He He was there all the time, and he, and He'd been looking for me. <laughs> uh, where was I? Where was I? Um, th- this is a question that you and I need to ask from time to time. Where are we? Where are we right now? Versus where we were a week ago, six months ago, a year ago. Um, because sometimes uh, we, we can often have a tendency to wander. We can have a tendency to wander. And then oftentimes we can sort of be a little bit proud about it. We can, we can talk like we're the same person that, that we've always been. Um, the great uh, North Carolina native, by the way, pioneer and long, uh, long-range hunter uh, who literally walked thousands of miles on his, on his, uh, on his feet and uh, opened up uh, the United States 
uh, even before it was fully, you know, what it is now. Daniel Boone, he made this comment. I've never been lost, but I will admit to being confused for several weeks. <laughs> and, you know, that, we look at that statement and, and there's a sense of humor about it. And, uh, but it's something that I would suggest to you is perhaps relatable to all of us at some level. Sometimes we're, we're a little bit reluctant to admit that, that we're lost. Perhaps just a little confused, but not lost. And God is, 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 is tempting us in, 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 uh, tempting us in a good way in, in trying to, to, to sort of lure us out of, uh, of the place where we are. It's not, that, it, it's not that an omniscient God didn't know where Adam and Eve were. And it's not that Adam and Eve didn't know where they were, neither in terms of the proximity of standing behind some trees or shrubs or whatever it was that they were standing behind. It was more of a spiritual question. Where are you? Where are you? The, the, the second uh, question is sort of a logical outflowing of, of this question. Where are you? And, and it, if you think you're, perhaps you've, you've outgrown that where are you question, and, and, and you know, that's, not a, that's not a question that's necessary for you, um, keep in mind, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, um, struggled with a similar question, but it was sort of the, the next line of questioning past where are you? In 1 Kings 19, we see Elijah, after he had uh, participated in some, uh, s- some mighty things, uh, this, this mighty outflowing of, of God, uh, sending fire from heaven, consuming a burnt offering, proving... Um, these prophets of Baal wrong, um, taking Ahab's chariot through the rain and through the storm and leading him back uh, to the palace. And then, you know, a lot of times when we are riding our, our biggest high, we are kind of sort of set up for our biggest fall. That All that adrenaline that we've spent is just gone. And then there's like this little pinprick that, that, that pops our balloon and, and, and we sort of fall to earth. And so in, in, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, we see Jezebel saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to take your life just like you took the lives of, of the prophets. And all, then all of a sudden, Elijah's on the run. Elijah's on the run. And it says he went to, on a day's journey, verse 4, into the wilderness. And he sat under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. I don't know about you, but I've had a few of those broom tree experiences where um, I was really discouraged. And a lot of times when we're discouraged, everything seems a lot worse than it really is. Our perception changes. In reality, things are not that much different than what... We think them to be, uh, we would normally think them to be, but in that state that we're at, it's like, how in the world can I get out of this? How how can things change? How can things get better? Um, perhaps you become discouraged with some challenges in life. Um, this is this is a good time uh, to to ask yourself, how did I get here? Um, you're not above that question because Elijah was not neither. But, but notice this, that, that God, God doesn't ask him any questions at that time. Have you ever been really overwhelmed with some, something and then uh, you're talking with somebody about it and they just start throwing out advice or probing and interrogating and things like that? It's not terribly helpful, is it, at that moment? <laughs> think, think of Job's friends, okay, that for the bulk of that book, are prognosticating his problems and how he got to where he got to, and they don't move an inch further to a solution, and and they don't really help. Okay. And the point is this: God had to had to take him out, bring him out from under the broom tree. He says he he, he offered him up food. He said, "You're going to need food for the journey." And I don't know what kind of food this was, but this was some awesome food because it said he, he ate and he drank, he lay down again, and then he wakes up and then he travels for 40 days on the strength of that food. 
I'm not sure what kind of food that is, but I'd like to have, have me some of that. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, and so on the strength of that, he goes 40 days and 40 nights to Oreb, the mountain of God. So he enters a cave and spends a night there. And, and, is, and it is then that the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, once again, we have an omniscient God. This is a rhetorical question. He's the one that gave him the food for the journey up to this cave. He knows <laughs> why he's there. But Elijah doesn't seem to know why, exactly why he's there. And, and, and this, is the, this is where Elijah opens up a little bit, starts whining and complaining a little bit. And when I say whine and complain, I'm not, I'm not denigrating Elijah at all. I've been there before, and I imagine most of you as well. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left. And they're looking for me to take my life. Okay, that's, that sounds like a desperate situation. And it's at this point that God uh, tells him to uh, go stand on the mountain. It says, in the Lord's presence. And then it says, at that moment, the Lord passed by. This is a similar passage in many ways to um, when, when Moses said to God, show me your glory. And it said that his presence passed by. Except there was wind, uh, there was uh, cliff shattering, earthquake, all this, but it says God was not there in that. And after all that, God was in a still small voice. And it was at that point, God could give him instruction about what he needed to do. God asked him an important question and was willing to wait for him to, to sort of come around. And certainly the, the passages after that are Elijah doing what God had asked him to do. Asking how we got to where we are in a certain place, when we're desperate, when we're frustrated, when we're overwhelmed. That's a, that's a good way of being able to step back um, and ask, ask ourselves, okay, what part do I have in this? What part is God, uh, does God play in this? And then where does he want me to go from here? Our third question, we're going to move over to the New Testament a little bit. We're going to, we're going to move over, over into the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20. This is, this is moving towards uh, the Messiah's death. In fact, this follows after Jesus predicts his death again for the third time. The mother of Zebedee, keep in mind this is Jesus' aunt because uh, John and James his cousins, um, approached him with her son, knelt down to ask him for something. Oh, and there's that, that question that, uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier was, what do you want? Um, but that's not the question that we're going to focus on a little, uh, uh, for this message. She said, promise that the two of my sons may sit, one on your right and one on your left in your kingdom. And so often, uh, where the disciples and where, quite honestly, most everybody understood Jesus was what his kingdom was about. They saw it as all the blessings they re would receive of, well, if, if he's the Messiah, what's my position to him? Okay? Um, and, you know, I'm sure she was uh, a very loving mother and she was just wanting to make sure that her, her boys were taken care of. But Jesus was like, you don't know, even know what you're asking. 
Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Now, what kind of question is that? I don't have a cup of, of water here, but, it, you know, that seems like a weird question to ask someone if you don't understand the context. Uh, hopefully, uh, for those who have uh, read their Bibles, they understand that drinking the cup means enduring suffering, enduring wrath. Are you able to drink this cup? You know, oftentimes when we come to faith, we're riding high, we're inspired. Uh, and, and, and then on top of that, a lot of times we're, we're sort of sold this bill of goods that, well, you know, if, if, if we start behaving ourselves and flying right, you know, life's going to get much easier. Okay? Now, I can, you know, when I, was, when I was going through my wandering time, and I didn't quite wonder as hard as perhaps some people do. I know some people have some pretty hard stories. I, I, I can still compare to my time wandering to when I started walking with the Lord, and I still, I suffered then and I suffered now, but it's a different kind of suffering. It's a different kind of suffering, okay? That suffering was really for no purpose whatsoever, and much of it I brought on myself, okay? Not all of it, but some of it. And now, the suffering is sort of different. Now keep in mind, those who suffer don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily suffering because they've deserved it. You know, Jeremiah 49, 12, when he's, he's pronouncing a curse upon the Edomites because, well, they, they deserved it. <laughs> he said, if those who do not deserve to drink the cup must drink it, can you possibly remain unpunished? So he was saying to the Edomites, you're going to suffer because you deserve it, because guess what? There's going to be some people that don't deserve it, and they're going to suffer too. And I don't understand why, but in, the, in, in God's economy, in God's plan of salvation, um, he chose not to remove suffering from the equation. And rather, he decided to use suffering as a means to grow you. Uh, we may suffer as collateral damage in the great controversy, in the, in the cosmic conflict. But James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 to 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. So just remember that the next time you're really suffering and struggling with something. Perhaps God is completing his work in you. And be encouraged. For those who, who may wonder why I've included such a question, this is, this is something that Jesus brought to his disciples over and over. This is, this is the story that, uh, or this is the idea that God brought to, Saul, to Paul, as, or Saul when he became Paul. Acts 9, 9, verse 16 says, I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Um, and like I said earlier on about su uh, suffering and, 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 and people that are new to the faith, you know, sometimes we're a little light on, on um, counting the cost. A little light on counting the cost in and, and, and terms of what we share to other people. Because I, I've, I've seen situations where people deal with, with uh, frustrations and bitterness over the fact that something happened to them once they started w w walking with the Lord. And I think it's a fair thing to do, once, uh, particularly after somebody's been baptized. Watch out. The devil's coming after you. The devil's coming after you. Okay? And, and this is not to d discourage people, okay? This is not to discourage people. This is to get people invested. This is to get people invested. You know, there's, a, there's an old story among uh, 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 marine recruiters who talk about, uh, you know, there was some sort of convention where the armed forces were to get together and, you know, they were to sort of put their best foot forward and present how, how wonderful it would be to join the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. And, and the Marines are always last to speak, you know. That's, 
typically how it is. <laughs> but uh, the, the other three branches got up and they just you know, spoke all this flowery speech about how wonderful it was to be, you know, serving in, in the military and all, all the wonderful things that they'd experienced and, and, and travel, seeing, uh, you know, in the Navy and in the Air Force and in the Army and all this. And they talked so much that there was just a few minutes left for, for the Marine to come up there. And by the time he came up there, um, he just had a couple of minutes. He, he's like, listen, this is a hard job. It's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done, did in your life. There's going to be times that you're going to want to die, okay? And if, if you're not interested, you probably don't want to join us. You know, you can join, you know, one of those other armed forces. And that was basically the gist of his message. I mean, it was like a couple of minutes. And afterwards, there was a line waiting to join the Marines. And, you know, not that many people looking to join uh, the other armed forces. And, and the lesson is here is people are... People need something to commit to. People want to know that what they do matters. People are willing to invest their lives if, they're, if it's something important. And certainly as a follower of Christ, um, understand that there will be hardships and there will be difficulties. And so it's important that we ask ourselves, are we willing to drink this cup? We don't know what that means in many cases. Uh, for, for some followers, as, as they met some hardships, they, were, they came much more acquainted with w what that would be. But being open to that, being, I, I have found that, that those who, who deal with hardships, um, who have the right posture toward it, are much more resilient, okay? I, I have a variety of people that come in my office, you know, and I don't really, you know, get hyper-focused on what this particular diagnosis and all that stuff is. I mean, certainly that's that's part of it. Um, but I've seen co people come in and they've told me stories that it's like made me want to just like crawl under the table because their story was so hard. And I was like, how in the world did they endure it? Um, but their posture toward that um, was good. And then, you know, on the other hand, I'll, I'll, I'll see somebody come in who is uh, by all material means well set and, you know, they really don't have much need of anything. And, um, you know, they're just sort of overwhelmed by their own little, you know, their own little uh, first world problems, you would say. And, and they can't get past it. What's the difference between the two? The difference is in the mindset. And when we, when we stay acquainted with the fact that life is going to be hard, it will cause, it, it will incorporate suffering. Particularly as a follower of Christ, it will incorporate that it will make us more resilient. Last question. For those who are checking their clocks. <laughs> um, let's turn over to, to, to John chapter 21. This is the passage where Jesus is, in the days after his resurrection, uh, resurrection is revealing himself to the disciples. And he has, he has something to say to Peter. Peter, the, the one who's so brash, the one that said he was willing to die for Jesus. Um, he who, whose mouth wrote checks that his flesh could not cash. <laughs> and Jesus asks him, keep in mind, there's, there's, there's only two passages in, uh, in Scripture that mention the, the words charcoal fire. And it's almost like God is sort of kind of recapturing that scene from the previous charcoal fire of the night of his... Uh, uh, I guess indictment and charges, you know, being charged and being sentenced. It was in front of that that Peter denied Jesus three times. He simply asks him, do you love me? Well, the first question, do you love me more than these? 
And what's Peter to say? Can, could Peter elaborate and wax poetic about how much he loved Jesus? Not much he can say. He just simply says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And what's Jesus' direction? What's his instruction? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep. And he asks this three times. And Peter knows. You, you ever have one of those conversations with, with somebody where it's like the point gets across without it being spoken of explicitly? It's kind of like, I know and you know and I know that you know. And, and Jesus doesn't really grill him. He just leaves it at that. Tend my lambs, feed my sheep. Jesus doesn't ask for you know, great pronouncements of what we're going to do for him. You know, in, in my line of work, uh, often when I'm working with couples, you know, one of the, one of the big f- focal points is love languages. I don't know if, who's heard of that, but it's, basically it's this idea that, um, generally speaking, um, we all have certain love languages. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, gifts, words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, and quality time. And, you know, in helping couples communicate with one another, it's just sort of them recognizing, okay, perhaps I'm communicating with my spouse in a way that, you know, that's not their love language. And so it's sort of learning to, to, to speak that love language. Now, I know this is a little bit of an anthropomorphism um, to, 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 to think about, but if God had a love language, what would it be? And typically, you know, when I'm working with folks, they, they usually identify, there's usually two prominent traits, and then the other three are just kind of in the background. Sometimes those two can flip, depend on the, on the circumstances, but it's usually two, two, two prominent uh, love languages. And oftentimes it is, it is this, quality time and acts of service. Quality time and acts of service. Um, those, I found that th- that generally wears well with, with most people, and it seems that that's God's primary love languages as well. Quality time and acts of service. When we look at John chapter 21, he's not looking for flowery words, he's not looking for gifts, he's not looking for anything except tend my lambs, feed my sheep, do you love me? Do you love me? And this does hearken a little bit to a passage in Revelation. You know, if this was going to be an Adventist sermon, I couldn't resist having Revelation in here somewhere, right? <laughs> to, the, to the letter at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, you know, this is a pretty impressive group, you know. He knows their works, their labor, their endurance. They can't tolerate evil. They've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And they found them to be liars. They're able to weed out the liars. They possess endurance. They've tolerated many things because my name and have not grown weary. They seem well acquainted with the, can you drink, uh, are you ready to drink this cup question. Seems like that they have that down, right? Seem, they seem like they have that nailed down. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Now that sounds more along the lines of the where are you, how did you get here type of questioning, right? Somewhere along the way, we as Christians, we can be sort of uh, singing from the same hymn, reading from the same scripture, you know, kind of going about doing, the th- doing what we've always done. But if we don't ask ourselves time to time, where are we? What are we doing here? Do we love him? You know, that love, can, that love can deteriorate over time. Sometimes we're just doing things out of pure muscle memory. Um, and this is not to diminish that at all. There's times when the feeling does go away, okay? Um, we shouldn't base our experience fully upon our feelings. But... It, but if we aren't spending that quality time with the Lord, if we aren't nurturing that time with the Lord, where are we? 
What is it that we love? Who is it that we love? Now his, his solution for this, further along, chapter 2, remember how far you've fallen. In other words, you were here, and now you're here. You've changed, you've changed your, you know, your proximity. Think about how far you've fallen. Remember it. And then repent and do the works you did at first. Notice that repentance is, is, is the, the important ingredient to this. He's not just saying do, do things, do stuff. He's saying repent. The word repent means to have a change of mind. And just to kind of do the cliff notes of the essence of repentance. If, if you're wondering, okay, how does one truly repent? Well, you have to move as close to God as you can stand it. And just like Jeremiah, the closer he got to God, it was like, whoa, I am un- undone. You will see your lack. You will see your need. You will see where you fall short. And more importantly, you will see the graciousness of God. And that's what changes a person's mind. It's not simply just a logical, well, I did this and I think I'm going to do that. It's looking at things from a different perspective. So the questions in Scripture, they're not just there to, you know, for us to kind of, you know, uh, wander around or, or to, to uh, you know, cause un, uh, just total uncertainty. They're there to move us into uh, continuing to get closer to Jesus. They're there to, to evoke our thoughts and to, and to, and to stimulate our thought, our thought process. And, and to engage with God, because that's ultimately what he's wanting. Um, so my prayer for you is that you continue to seek the Lord with an open heart and mind, and that your eyes may be opened. Our closing hymn is uh, number 326, Open My Eyes That I May See.